Hi, I'm Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 75 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. On today's episode of the podcast, I'm pleased to be speaking with Dr. Cornell Volak, who is a prominent international performer, member of the Double Double Duo, is actively involved with the Speech Language Pathology Department at the University of Toronto, and is the author of a new book called Articulation Types on Clarinet, which is the main focus of today's conversation. I had the wonderful pleasure of meeting Cornell not only at Clarinet Fest this past summer, which is where we decided to uh, plan and schedule this interview, um, but also at a concert which he performed in Airdrie, Alberta, which was really close to home for me. I have to say it was one of the best concerts I've ever seen. I was just amazed by their musicianship and the way they interacted with the audience. And right after the advertisements today, you're going to get to hear a performance and see exactly what I mean. Before we get started today, I'd like to thank all those listeners who are supporting the podcast on Patreon. You can do this at clarineat.com slash support. We have 35 backers right now, and when we get to 50, I'll be commissioning Clarineat's own app, which means that you won't actually have to download a third-party player to listen. You can just install the Clarineat app for free on your Android or Apple device and start listening. The Clarineat Podcast is hosted by Mo Bleichner Music Distribution. You can check out their newest product, the $49 Match Pitch Barrel, at the Clarineat.com online store. Head to Clarineat.com slash store. Of course, today's episode of the podcast is also brought to you by our season sponsor, Daria Woodwinds. And I bring you today's guest after this short message. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit D'Addario.com slash woodwinds. So I'm here today with Cornell Volak. Uh, welcome to the show, Cornell. Thank you for having me. Hello. I'm really happy to say that not only was I having the chance, or not only did I have the chance to meet you at Clarinet Fest this summer, I also recently had the opportunity to see you perform live in Airdrie, Alberta, while you were here. And before we get started, I just have to say what a great performance that was. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. And thank you even more for coming out on that uh, snowy and stormy um, afternoon. It was lovely to have you there. Thank you. It was a particularly stormy night, but it was just such a great thing. I was actually watching, and as I was watching, I took notes about all the things I kind of wanted to ask you about. And uh, it was just so much better to actually see an upcoming guest play live instead of just reading the bio and sort of listening to CDs in my basement by myself. So uh, (laughs) great preparation, great preparation. Well, it's always a great social experience when you you go and interact with your audience, and especially, you know, in the format that I'm doing it. With my accordionist, we are part of the Double Double Duo. Uh, this is one of the projects that I have uh, going. And uh, the format that we that we run our shows uh, is that, that the interaction with the audience takes up quite a big chunk of the show. So um, I'm glad that it, it was to your liking. <laughs> so, to so yeah, the dynamic between the two of you is just fantastic with the Double Double Duo. Um, what, what's a little bit of history about it for those who have not uh, heard of it, and how did you guys get together to play? I think it would be sensible to, to tell our listeners that Double Double Duo is a duo of a clarinet and accordion. 
um, because I did not mention that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think yet. And uh, the duo consists of me and Michael Bridge, who is a phenomenal Canadian, young Canadian accordionist. And um, I remember when I was back um, with Quartetto Gelato, I was part of Quartetto Gelato, I was touring with them. Um, they... Uh, they had an accordionist in, in the group. They still do, Alexander Sebastian, another great accordionist. And uh, sometimes on the side, I would play with Alex. But then I uh, finished my uh, my contract with Quartetto Gelato, and I decided not to extend it. And then I thought, you know, it would be great to continue with, with accordion uh, because it gives such a you know flexibility in terms of repertoire choices and uh, audiences as well like different demographics and so on and so on. only great things can come out um, from playing um on the clarinet and accordion really uh and so i i was talking to professor joe Massarolo, who is the prof of accordion at the university of toronto and we played quite a bit together and at some point you know it got too busy and he told me cornell listen look i have grandchildren I cannot go with you on the road. <laughs> but I have this uh, young student here who uh, would be a perfect fit for you. I was like, oh, okay, let me see. Who's that fit? And then I met Michael and we clicked as a duo. And ever since, there will be almost five years. Next year, we'll have our fifth year anniversary. We've been extensively touring together. We've been to Europe touring there. We've been to South America. We've been to the States. And we toured a lot across Canada. That's that's main thing that we're doing. Today. We recorded two albums, working on the third one, and uh, we're going strong. And uh, that the show that you saw last week uh, was another version of our um, of our um, original show. So I have to ask because I'm Canadian and I know that uh, your colleague there is from Calgary actually as well. And or he grew up here anyways. Um, you're originally from Poland, but you now live in Canada, of course. Is the term double double in any way in relation to the typical uh, Tim Hortons kind of double double Canadian beverage that we enjoy? <laughs> you know, I'm glad you're asking because during during a Q&A the section of our shows, there is always one or two audience members who inquire about our name. Uh, asking exactly the same question because double double duo double double is the double cream double sugar right in uh, at importance cafe this yeah. is the type of coffee <laughs> being served <laughs> the name double double uh comes from the fact that both of us uh, we double on piano ah. so i play clarinet and piano and michael plays accordion and piano as well sometimes michael also uh, sings while at the piano so we thought, you know, if you are doubling the instruments, then we are doubling the fun. So why not we call ourselves Double Double Duo, you know? So, and this is how the term came, uh, became uh, our, our uh, hallmark of the duo. I love that. And I love how it kind of plays into the, you know, for those who even, even if it's not intended that way, it sort of can be interpreted that way as kind of a fun little, uh, uh, you know, Canadian spin on the, on the name of the group. So, <laughs> yes, and it, it is certainly it is. And, uh, uh, there's, um, the name is not necessarily self-explanatory, but um, it definitely brings up some curiosity. And when you see clarinet and accordion on the picture, and it says double double. Uh, it raises a few eyebrows and uh, <laughs> somehow warms up people's hearts to come and hear it. <laughs> well, of course, the musical performance was absolutely impeccable. And I do want to talk about that too. But I was also very impressed by not only the stage presence but the audience interaction. So. So what's sort of your philosophy on that and, and how does it play into the live show planning? I tell you, for us, it's so important to have the right connection with the audience to the point that when we go um, to our sound check before the concert, one of the most important thing uh, for us after having the sound uh, properly set up by the sound engineer is the lighting. You know, we are really big on seeing uh, our audience's faces because oh. this is one of the things that tell us exactly how people react to our music, to our musical selections. And it helps us to, um, to structure the emotional contour of the show. 
So we know what pieces, or like we give a written program uh, to the presenter ahead of time, of course. But then we don't always follow the order, but we always follow um, people's expressions, right? If Depending on how they feel on the day, whatever the experiences were, and if we can see them, even when when we have the spotlights blasting in our you know into our eyes, um, then we craft the show on the fly. Sometimes we even exchange some pieces depending. So we have the right emotional tension, so people are not bored and um, and definitely moved. Because um, the key to our performance is to move people, to leave an impression upon them. And um, in support of, of our music, we also use a certain formula um, of verbal interactions, right? Mm -hmm. So it is important for the people to, to um, not only hear high-quality music, because this is what's demanded, but also to have the opportunity to get to know their artists person, on a like more personal level. And it seems that whenever we go back to some of the communities that we toured five years ago or four years ago, and it so happens that we are reinvited, uh, people would come to us and say how much they enjoyed the first show and they remembered some of the stories we told them. So we were really impressed that not only they remembered the music, they, what they felt, how the music made them feel, uh, that they remembered that, but they also remember particulars stories or experiences that we shared with them from the stage. So this is a big part of our philosophy of, of putting on a, a concert or a show for our audiences. Well, I think it's so true. And I, I definitely felt after the show that I'd, I'd not only watched music and enjoyed music, but gotten to know someone. Um, and also the, I felt like I got to do that with a group of people in the audience. And, and one of the things that surprised me was when you guys opened up the floor for questions, um, people were a little hesitant, but after a few moments, it was obvious that there wouldn't be enough time to answer all the questions because um, they just kept coming. People were really excited about that. They didn't expect to interact in that way, and I think they were pleasantly surprised. <laughs> that is that is so true for almost every show. You know, the demographics of the particular audience that uh, was present in the hall where you were there uh, was such that um, people were... Um, those who came, uh, you know, they had to commute. Uh, the weather was really hard on them to get there, number one. And most of them were um, seniors, mm -hmm. you know. And um, most of them, they they were expecting just a regular um, performance when there were pieces, when there were some verbal introductions, and that's it. So when the expectations are not necessarily met, they have, like, you are setting the stage for a new set, oh, like you are setting the ex expectations somewhere else, like higher or or just simply a different set of expectations. So you kind of have to lay down a new ground for these people. So they have to have time to get used to it, number mm -hmm. one, to your style. And then when it's delivered with uh, um, lighthearted, you know, um, introductions and, and even if they hear, see you smile or even laugh because some of the things that we tell, you know, uh, some of our touring stories or, or uh, stories from our childhoods, even when people ask, when they make ourselves laugh, people laugh with you and then they open up and they really want to <laughs> want to know much more where you come from and how you found your way as an artist to that stage there and then. You know? I think the funniest moment for me or the most compelling question was uh, when someone asked about how how the uh, the accordion operated. And for those who don't know, he was using kind of a, I can't remember the term or the name of it, but it was an accordion that didn't just have a little keyboard on there. There was hundreds of little buttons on both yes. sides. It was um, a button accordion, yes. Yeah, a button accordion. And uh, it had a really rich symphonic kind of tone that could be blended with the different buttons. And uh, anyways, he talked about how many reeds it had inside. And I always knew that the accordion was a reed instrument, but I, I didn't know that it had so many reeds. I think he said there was over 400 reeds in this little box. Um, it's close, close to 500 reeds. It's crazy. It's, it's a insane. lot. And of course, you then made the joke that the clarinet has only one, but it can play more, more notes, so it's <laughs> <laughs> superior or whatever. It was really funny. It was a great interaction. Um, but then you mentioned how it creates a great blend that's actually surprising. Like Not many people write for accordion and clarinet. That's very true. Uh, I think that this 
particular blend of instruments is still underexplored by contemporary composers. And because uh, accordion comes from more folk tradition than a concert clarinet, let's say, uh, that comes from more orchestral tradition, um, this is why there is not enough compositions that there will be a concert compositions, you know, mm. like for for recitals sort of thing. Um, but there is a lot of uh, improvisatory pieces and folk music uh, because obviously clarinet is as well uh, uh, an instrument that that has an incredibly strong folk tradition, right? Um, and like in, let's say, French music, it's, it's uh, clarinet is very present there, as so is accordion. Then Balkan music, you know, then all mid and Eastern European uh, tradition uh, with, with these small bands of musicians that were walking, you know, down the streets and so on. All of them were using um, a harmonic instrument, such as accordion, maybe guitar or mandolin, and there was always some lead instrument, such as clarinet, violin, you know, or harmonica or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So, but as concert duo that goes up on stage and uh, is to present a written, properly composed uh, repertoire, we still um, don't have enough pieces of that kind. I know that there is a lot of contemporary compositions for, for accordion, and I know that through Michael, who plays a lot of contemporary music. And I know that there's a lot of contemporary music for the clarinet, but clarinet usually is either treated um, as solo or with piano mm-hmm. or, with, or with strings. But I think that there's the sonorities of the two instruments are so interesting that it, in, it should invite you know, contemporary composers to explore it even more. Well, of course, you've kind of solved this problem by extensively and really, really fantastically arranging all of your pieces um, for the duo. So, well, this is definitely the part of our collaboration, uh, besides, of course, from practicing, that takes the most time to arrange pieces. Uh, it takes the most time because um, um, because of the shortage of original pieces and also driven by the ambition of being original, we don't want to just pick up pieces that are, let's say, composed for clarinet and piano and arranged them for clarinet and accordion without changing anything and just being comfortable. So it would not necessarily, this is not necessarily our goal. Our goal is to play pieces that are challenging um, on many levels to us, uh, but also uh, hopefully easy to be appreciated for our audiences, you know, and also entertaining at times as well. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, these are the standards that we have to meet in order to have um, a successful arrangements that fit our programming. And so with the arranging itself, I mean, do you, how do you approach some of the, the pieces, especially the ones that are outside of the so-called normal genre? I mean, you play a lot of Baroque sort of music and uh, it's just the instruments weren't even around. So, so in what ways do you make them your own and new and in what ways do you keep them the same? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, with Baroque, it's, um, with any genre, it's, it's difficult. But especially with Baroque, there's a lot of people who are purists, right? So we are not necessarily uh, delivering our arrangements to, to purists, but we want to popularize that music among general audiences, right? Mm-hmm. And show how well those pieces can fall into the idiom of the two instruments. And... Um, as we know, as musicians, we do know that in Baroque era, um, the type of instrument that would be playing a particular composition was not as relevant as the integrity, like the harmonic and uh, um, uh, rhythmic uh, integrity of that piece. Mm-hmm. So we really do put a lot of effort in making sure that the harmonies uh, stay the same. Uh, or are um, modified in a way that they do not change the pattern that the composer originally intended. So in many ways, we do take uh, basso continuo uh, when we have the uh, numbered bass, right? Mm -hmm. And we make up those harmonies according to um, how well it blends with the solo line of whatever instrument I would be transposing from. 
um, and create it like that. So actually, it's got an element of improvisation, but within what the composer intended, right? Hmm. And uh, we're lucky enough to have such a broad range of uh, not only ambitus, um, uh, you know, the scale um, in terms of accordion, but also different stops on accordions that can actually bring um, different colors to um, to our arrangements and uh, to different melody, different lines, right? Whenever we play some polyphonic music, um, because it, it corresponds to either harpsichord's range or a pianoforte range or a guitar range and so on and so on. And also, well, the main difference is um, that has to be overcome is uh, the fact that accordion sound doesn't have to decay after it's been struck. Mm, yeah. As it is the case with a pianoforte or with a harpsichord, right? So in that sense, uh, it puts a completely new spin on the music from the Baroque period. However, let's not forget that there were a lot of pieces for uh, organ, for instance, which we also transpose, that the idiom uh, of organ and accordion overlap perfectly, right? So, so if we solve that, let's say, by arranging from uh, organ pieces, then we have to battle with the solo line, <laughs> the clarinet, which um, the clarinet at that time was was still at a very early developmental stage. So I would be playing a traverso flute line or a violin line or a cello line or one of the lines from the organ piece, for instance. Right? Mm-hmm. But to challenge ourselves and to stay very fresh with our arranging, uh, we really do like to um, uh, follow the basso continuo and make up the harmonies, uh, particular voicing by ourselves. You know, so this is this is where we really put a lot of attention and time. Well, the relationship between the two instruments at times it just had a really true, like amazing, almost symphonic quality. I I was quite blown away. Um, really interesting arrangements and wonderful use of the instruments. Uh, like nothing I've ever heard, anyways. Well, thank you very much. Um, we've uh, we've come to to a very intimate understanding of the particularities of of both instruments, and we have developed uh, a few so called I would I would call them by default sounds. Mm-hmm. So if there is a virtuoso playing for clarinet and particular accompaniment in the clar- in an accordion, we have figured out what kind of stops on accordion work for that particular setting. Then if there is like a lyrical aria uh, like, you know, melody in the clarinet line, then we also have a particular by default, you know, setting on the accordion for better blending. Um, and then also when, when the two instruments, when the clarinet plays accompaniment, you know, to accordion, then bringing up the, you know, higher voices on accordion require a completely different setting of, or a different set of stops uh, and so on and so on. And then there are the interplays between those um, uh, settings, of course. Um, the challenge uh, very often is the fact that clarinet still tunes with odd harmonics as opposed to the accordion, which tunes in uh, octaves, right? Oh, yes. um, and that, every time we have to take that under consideration, especially when we figure out the baseline, right? Um, so uh, I always, we, we have to be um, careful sometimes with with putting our thirds into the chorus in particular, <laughs> in particular spots and so on. I just don't want to bore you with, with all that because no, that, no, it's very um, interesting. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad you find it find it interesting. Hopefully, our listeners will find it interesting too. But there are certain uh, well, it all comes from uh, from the premise that that, for instance, Michael playing accordion, he cannot bend any pitch uh, at any given uh, time. Once he plays a chord, it stays there, and um, and intonation uh, from my experience as a clarinetist, which basically is the priority number one after rhythm um, throughout my life, is such that a lot of tone color will depend on the intonation, actually. 
uh, it's very interesting how information impacts uh, how we perceive a chord or how we hear that particular interval. Um, so we never we never leave that out of the equation when we arrange. You know, we're very sensitive to to the harmonies and to the intervals. And uh, in that respect, it sort of resembles uh, early <laughs> early um, uh, classical. A clarinetist battles uh, with the uh, so-called <laughs> tempered pitch. Um, I was going to ask, and, actually. So, is the accordion? Uh, it's is it tuned to four forty, and is it equal temperament, or is it slightly? It, no, no, it is equal. It's just uh, pretty much like a piano. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty much like a piano, and um, it's got its own you know particularities, and it also does go out of tune and. Well, you know, on that note, I will take a liberty to to say a few words about accordion that I've learned over the time um, from working with different accordionists. Uh, accordion is 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 so interesting in that regard that um, once you buy yourself an accordion that possesses the tone qualities that you like, for instance then this instrument becomes accordionist's kind of project mm. to be developed. So if, if this is a high-quality instrument, let's say, and it's got that thing that you like about it, then over the years, you would add little things. You would file with, with a file. Uh, you would um, thin out certain reeds inside to to make sure that certain intervals are to your liking. Uh, you would add, um, I know, um, a particular elements that resonate better. Um, you know, this is amazing. Like I've met some accordionists through Michael um, that have been improving their accordions for at least 10 years and still been a work in progress. Wow. And it's amazing how this instrument can change over the years if you constantly keep on working on it. I did not know that because clarinet's life is much shorter, at least in my case. Um, I never, I don't think I've ever played um, 10 years on any given instrument. Um, but even within within uh, the period of a couple of years that I tend to play one uh, set of clarinets, I, I have managed to develop uh, the sound of the clarinet working with my technician, who is based down in Indianapolis. It's uh, Mr. Um, David Strobinger, a master technician, uh, who helps me with uh, all kinds of issues on my instruments. But I definitely never had uh, an opportunity to be developing my particular sound over 10 or 15, even in some cases, years on one set of instruments. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, accordion is a quite amazing instrument that can be highly, highly, highly customized. And I've heard some accordionists who had very different and very personal sounds on their accordions after years of, of development. Well, it's not an instrument I know much about, so it is very interesting to learn. Um, and I'm sure many of our listeners also find that intriguing. I, I also had no idea about pretty much any of that. Well, it's. I think these are kind of little insights that you get to to learn when you interact with uh, with a player um, for a long time. I would say, right? Because before, when I was getting together with different accordionists um, to play a particular uh, concert, then you just rehearse and and you split your part your ways. But when you actually stay together as a duo and you develop your own duo sound. Mm -hmm. Then you get to really learn about uh, certain technicalities and possibilities within that other instrument, which I find also fascinating. Well, it was another element of the programming which I enjoyed because you had both the opportunity to perform solo pieces and the accordion by itself is, is especially something that people don't get the chance to hear very much. Um, and for the clarinet, um, you were really uh, very skilled as far as like the circular breathing goes. Uh, what's your... What's the secret for that? Or how can someone get better at that? I mean, you were, I think you did not breathe the entire piece. It was a little short Bach. I uh, uh, can't remember the exact piece that you played right now, but it was uh, about, you know, at least two or three minutes long, but I don't think you breathed the whole time. No, I 
I'm, I'm, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I met my goal, <laughs> you know, in terms, uh, uh, in terms of breeding and phrasing then. Um, yes, this is uh, a big question. Um, and I tell you, um, the idea of circular breeding for me originated from the fact that I play quite a bit of Baroque music, uh, which also led me to uh, have my doctoral thesis uh, uh, wrote, I, I wrote it on um, Baroque music uh, in the repertory of the contemporary clarinetist, um, where I talk about arrangements and uh, some techniques and articulation and also about rhetorics in uh, Baroque music. Um, and certain phrasing on, uh, you know, in, in the Baroque period can be only accomplished if you do not break the line. Uh, and I'm talking about instrumental music, mm -hmm. uh, because obviously in Baroque you also had oratorios and, and early operas and so on, where singers do have to breathe and it's part of their, um, of their uh, arias and, and phrasing. However, when it comes to instrumental music, the, the instruments that were the best developed and available for Baroque composers were string instruments. Um, and those instruments, uh, and also, uh, and also flutes and, uh, you know, the, the whole family of flutes and so on. But even on flutes, you do, uh, circular, circular brief if, if necessary. Um, but string instruments, definitely the, the, the writings for strings in Baroque was very advanced and, uh, and very popular. And if we want to learn about that style, it's, um, there is no way around it. You just pick up those pieces, like some of the um, solo suites or partitas uh, for violin and for solo cello, and you want to play them to learn the style. And um, once uh, this is being arranged uh, in order to to feel that you know the phrasing, you really want to play it from the beginning to the end, as a string instrument would do. So that definitely calls for for mastering the technique of, of circular breathing. So this was uh, just a little bit of background um, of, of my approach uh, to circular breathing. It is, it's never been to impress anybody, quite frankly. It's always been to um, learn about the style of the period of music that has been of my uh, great deepest interest, uh, which is Baroque and early classical. Um, this technique, um, it's not, I, I wouldn't say that it's necessary to, to have, uh, if one is not, um, as keen on performing, uh, arranged music from different, uh, instruments, uh, that, that possess a completely different idiom, such as string instruments or, or even, uh, keyboard instruments. However, uh, through the process of learning it, every clarinetist or saxoph saxophonist or any other, uh, wind instrumentalists can learn a great, great deal about me the mechanics of his or her embouchure. Mm -hmm. And I would greatly encourage everyone to, at some point of their uh, career or learning, uh, to embark upon uh, uh, adding this technique to, to their um, repertory of uh, articulation. Uh, or, or breathing techniques in order to experience firsthand the benefits that come only just from learning it. So, um, but uh, in terms of how to do it, I would uh, rather not go into detail here, you know, verbally, because it can be so misleading, you know, certain parts of, um, of the process of circular breathing can be, um, understood in more than one way mm -hmm. uh, and it can lead to confusion uh, basically this also uh, I'm, I'm saying it from my own experience when I was being explained um, some of the principles of, of circuited breathing uh, verbally without uh, seeing it or experiencing it firsthand and being able to ask particular questions uh, as the explanations were given to me so I know that it can be highly confusing therefore i would rather not do not do any damage right? <laughs> that's okay that's okay you know and i i do appreciate your perspective on it and i i also value really what you said it reminds me of something that uh, actually martin frost said i'd asked him about some other extended technique and he actually gave a similar answer in that um uh he said he never learns these things just kind of 
for fun. It's it's always for a musical context, and uh, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head with the the circular breathing there as well. It's it's not that it's a cool party trick. It's that it allows you to play Baroque music more uh, true to the intent. Certainly, I think there should be a a purpose behind learn behind uh, 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 putting oneself through the process of learning something that is not necessarily the most natural thing to do. Uh, there must be a purpose and determination behind it, and at the end of that line, uh, the result must be, must be related to. Uh, to the intent, to the original idea, right? So in that regard, I absolutely agree with Martin here uh, that uh, one shouldn't just, uh, I don't decide one day, yeah, I want to learn how to circle breathe and then let me try it for 20 minutes and then and then let's forget about the matter, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think with him, I was talking specifically about tonguing, which actually segues very well into your book. But uh, he said, you know, it's not like I just sit down and try and find out how fast I can tongue. Like I, I reach a point in a piece that needs it and I figure out a way to get there, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, there is there is no better wa- way of... Uh, of um, uh, uh, learning than actually solving a particular problem and being determined in, in having it resolved, right? Mm-hmm. So that gives uh, that gives an incredible motivation to overcome it. Let's talk a little bit about your book here, actually, then. So you, you are working at the speech pathology department at the University of Toronto doing some research, and you are... You've released recently a fascinating book. It's about uh, 60 pages long, uh, complete with full diagrams and explanations and kind of reaching some objective truths about not only articulation itself, but but also ways of teaching and explaining it. Um, so in, in a nutshell, like who is this book intended for and what do you expect to see from its being published? Well, I intended this book definitely uh, to clarinet educators. Um, as a teaching aid to uh, clarinet instructors, uh, as well as any student that is keen on teaching themselves uh, how to how, what are existing tonguing solutions, mm-hmm. I shall say. Uh, because when we talk about tonguing, very often we just think about single double tonguing, and usually this is where. Um, where we end with with uh, with the tonguing secrets, so to speak. But uh, I found out some other very interesting. Um, I, 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 I found found them and researched them. Uh, different staccato articulation uh, solutions, such what I mentioned is uh, side to side tonguing, which is lateral tonguing. On the on the read multiple tanking or synthetic speed tanking developed by different uh, clarinetists um, uh, through, through um, uh, you know uh, different um, methods of uh, experimentation, obviously, and those uh, options are there available to anyone really who is seeking solution to um, tanking uh, throughout. The entire clarinet range at any given speed um, and at any given um, uh, dynamics. Because what's important about articulation is that it is, first of all, consistent, second of all, controlled, and also uh, clear, and in many well, and uh, not limiting the player to a particular register or to a particular speed um, because we want to have the control over it throughout the entire range and then given, as I said, um, articulation and uh, dynamics. So I am a strong advocate of using more than one or two even articulation types throughout uh, one piece or even throughout one scale, if necessary. If we're especially approaching the third register of the clarinet, the altissimo register, um, there is a, a very complicated set of uh, physics and uh, acoustics that come into place that I will not try to explain here, because this would take another episode alone to explain how um, and why 
there's so many difficulties uh, that we encounter in the highest register, but there are solutions. And I, for instance, think that we should be able to switch from one articulation type to another seamlessly in order to overcome uh, the as- acoustical phenomena of the of the instrument uh, in order to uh, keep our uh, articulation um, consistent and controlled. So I wouldn't just advocate, you know, learning um, and playing everything single tonguing up and down or in different passages or, or double tonguing only. Or I would advocate going to venturing to other types of uh, tonguing um, in the middle of the passage for instance, if necessary, so we don't slow down or we don't uh, um, get more back pressure from the instrument or we don't get simply stressed out that we will not uh, make it uh, as, you know, with a, with a proper success rate that we expect from ourselves. So I, we do need solutions, and I do provide them in my book. And when and, muscles uh, are used, like any muscle, when it's used repeatedly, it gets tired more quickly. So if in a way what you've done too by changing the uh articulation style mid passage is you've actually prolonged the, the ability of tonguing uh quickly absolutely and the speed of articulation is not the only objective of mine mm-hmm. uh just just so i'm absolutely clear i wouldn't go well the style this. as well and the the, the <laughs> You know, it's funny because Brad Bain recently mentioned on his app when we chatted a couple weeks ago um, that he, you know, one of the things he, I can't remember the way he worded it, but he mentioned something like, it's too bad we only have a couple articulation markings because there are infinite articulations. Um, and so many people just play a, a note short or long and it, it kind of just maybe accented, but they've only got three or four sort of articulations in their back pocket um, when in reality you could have anything. And and you've really opened the door here with so many interesting ideas. The one I'm particularly interested about is the on-the-read multiple tonguing. Would you explain that a little bit? On-the-read multiple tonguing? Um, yes. Um, I would like to tell you about it. It's, uh, it's the type of tonguing in which the, the tip of the tongue moves vertically, but not the entire tongue. So the back of the tongue and the mid part of the tongue, which is the tongue body and tongue dorsum, um, are set up in order to provide a proper voicing for the register in which the tonguing is happening. But the tip of the tongue alone is uh, performing a vertical motion, as if one were to pronounce uh, syllabi, Toodle doodle 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 in English. Mm-hmm. Oodle doodle doodle doodle. So the tip goes up and down and up and down, and it strikes the very tip of the reed with a vertical motion. This is a very effective um, type of articulation that can be 100% effective throughout the entire range of the clarinet, and we will not crack on us with an undertone in the highest register if the back of the tongue is voicing it properly, and it can in this particular articulation type. Well, um, however, there's always an asterisk, and there are always conditions applied to to every solution. However, not everyone uh, is prone to be a master of this articulation, because uh, one of the reasons why I provide so many different articulation types in the book is that Some of the articulation types are easier to perform for different players. Mm -hmm. And this can be due to natural abilities of uh, people's uh, tongue muscles um, and uh, even uh, uh, by the language that we we speak. You know, I've noticed that uh, from... From the, uh, clarinetists from different cultures tend to use different articulation types, you know, predominantly, um, the, the, you know, uh, they could use uh, lateral, uh, for instance, in, in Eastern Europe or in Balkans. And I found quite a few clarinetists and saxophone players who would actually use to a great success a lateral tongue which is a great alternative to, um, to double tonguing in the highest register. You know, and I found less um, um, uh, clar- players who would who would practice this technique in North America, for instance. But in North America, I found 
quite a few players who would use the on the read multiple tonguing that mm-hmm. we just uh, talked about uh, over people from Europe, for instance. You know, so um, this is all uh, a good um, uh, material for for extensive research <laughs> later down the road. How uh, uh, languages. Uh, uh, would uh, 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 shape our approach to, to tonguing on <laughs> various wind instruments. However, uh, with what's at hand, I think there is enough information and enough solution uh, solutions uh, for for clarinetists to start uh, explorations of their own. Because you know, uh, the solutions that I'm providing, they could be just could be treated as as a gateway, you know, to developing uh, a very personal articulation style. Um, that could have no name, but could have a great efficiency and and benefit. Well, and you go over so many different types in here. And the one thing I, I was wondering about too is, uh, and you know, by the way, for anyone who's a teacher, um, this is an absolute must have read because um, it's something that you're going to use. You know, I, I would say honestly, and with probably every student, because there's just ways to visualize what uh, you're trying to explain. And there's so many times where I've tried to draw my, you know, version of the mouth or whatever with the little reed in there and the tongue, and it never looks anything close to how amazing these graphics are looking. So just for the, the graphics alone, this book is worth it. But the little explanations are, are so down to earth. And I know that we're, we're using some, you know, we're, we're talking in pretty advanced language here on the podcast, assuming all clarinet players. But even to explain to a beginner, I, I find you've worded everything in a way that's very easy to understand and absorb. So... It's really, it's really fantastically laid out. Um, but for example, you go over double tonguing, um, on the reed tonguing, uh, different sorts of, you call synth- synthetic speed tonguing, uh, flutter tonguing, uh, v- singing and tonguing. Like there's just everything you can really think of in here. Um, with double tonguing, or I guess what I was going to say is that with my teaching, one of the things, and I, I wanted your thoughts on this, one of the things I like to talk about is it's not always the way something feels, it's the way something sounds. And we shouldn't be aiming for a, a feeling sensation with the articulation. It's it's almost an oral uh, feedback. You know, you do something, and how does it sound when it when it's done? Um, is that something that you think about in your philosophy, or is it the opposite? No, no. Uh, this book is a merely a, a guide to articulation. I would never take it uh, too literally. Um, quite frankly, I would never take any. Uh, suggestions or explanations too literally. Um, well, everyone's because, different. Because everyone is different and and sometimes the wording can obscure things rather than make them clear. What I always do recommend to, to students is uh, to listen <laughs> to their own ears. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that ears are designed to listen, not to be listened to, but metaphorically speaking, uh, the ear is the best teacher, quite frankly. So um, the ear first has to be trained how something can sound uh, and then make a choice whether or not I would like to sound like that performing this particular articulation or, uh, you know, um, or a drill. And then the rest is to find a way of doing it internally, having that that example memorized orally. You know? So in that way, what we hear, and if we like what we hear, we will physically find the way to replicate it by ourselves. And by doing so, we self-teach ourselves. And if we persist enough, we can actually serve Pass even um, the um, uh, the ideal that we had in our ears at some point. So my book is only to give more suggestions as to um, for those of us who do need to see it visualized. Mm-hmm. I do understand and appreciate the fact that a lot of us are um, very visual. You know, we, um, you know, eyes are a very, very strong sense in our bodies. So, and it very often it is easier for us to see something and then internalize it through the visual image, right? Um, so this is why my book is rich in graphics. So um, 
when we hear something, uh, let's say a person, a clarinetist or someone will, will demonstrate a particular type of articulation to us, so we listen to it. And then we can match it with certain graphic, you know, from, from the book and to see which part of the tongue approximately is touching which part of the reed and in which motion. And then that is just a guide. And how we will accomplish it with our own uh, tongue, um, on our own, that is just basically uh, up to us and our um, capacities, you know, of what we are capable of, of working out by ourselves. And this self-teaching um, process is what is the real goal, you know, long term. Because through exploring and self-teaching, our understanding of our limitations and limitations of the instrument is becoming much richer. And understanding the limitations is the first and the most fundamental step of overcoming them. And and this is what I do advocate in, in my teaching, and this is why and how this book came came to being. I hope I, uh, I, mean, I explained myself in the most coherent way and uh, you are not jumping at me with <laughs> objections. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And, you know, I'm going to be, uh, Cornell has uh, generously um, allowed me to show a few pictures on the show notes for this page. If you're wondering, kind of want to preview before you look into the book further um, as to the sort of the quality of the graphics and even just to sort of see uh, visually for yourself some of the things that we're talking about. So. So thank mm-hmm. you for that. And um, is there anything else you'd like to discuss about the book or anything that you're working on before we move on to the, the lightning round, which is sort of the, the ending of the episode? No. no, absolutely not. I think I've said enough or too much <laughs> even already <laughs> on that. Well, no, I really appreciate your expertise. And it's just my biggest regret from Clarnet Fest was not getting a chance to see your session there. There's, As I discussed in the Clarnet Fest episode, it's impossible to see everything. It's one of the, Oh, it's impossible. It's, that, uh, that conference is huge and there are yeah. so many things happening simultaneously, you know, because there's so many participants and there's always something to go to and, and the scheduling is done in, in the best possible way. But with this amount of participants, uh, things have to be happening, happening simultaneously. So you can't possibly be in two or three or four places at the same time. So I absolutely understand. Um, however, if there will be any, any further questions, uh, about, uh, clarinet technique or the book or whatever, I would be very happy to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, answer them to whoever will seek any answers. Well, I have to say that the, the reason that we did end up getting in touch, I can't remember who actually did introduce at the, us at the festival, but what had happened was everyone was raving about this, uh, the presentation oh. that you did and telling me about it. And I was, uh, I was, uh, compelled for sure to, if I didn't meet you there, at least reach out afterwards. And I'm, I'm glad we had the chance to finally talk. So. Well, so am I. I'm, I'm very thankful for this time uh, we're having right now, you know, um, talking about all these issues because they are, these issues are very close and very important to all of us uh, wind players. And we all should be sharing this information um, if, if we have them available because um, wind technique is, an, is, is like an evolving phenomena that should never stop evolving. Uh, and that only happens and it gets better uh, through sharing the information and sharing the experiences. So this is what we are doing here right now. And I'm very thankful for, for this opportunity. Um, thank you for providing your wonderful platform for, for, this, for sharing this information, Sean. Oh, thank you. No, it's a pleasure to share these kind of stories. I think it's really, really wonderful to get them out there. So. Let's move on to the lightning round here. So this is a set of seven questions um, oh. that are, I ask every guest. And um, they're all designed to be answered in under a minute. So are you ready? Uh, right. And what's the prize? <laughs> <laughs> there is no prize. <laughs> uh, personal pride. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, uh, Charles Nydick, too, said something like, oh, it feels like we're going on a game show or something okay. like that. <laughs> oh, right. But, the uh, game is on. So. Claire Neat game show. Here we go. <laughs> all right. So if I were to walk over to your music stand right now, what would I find on it? Nothing. There is no music stand. I learn and practice things uh, mostly from memory, and uh, I play. I play most of my music memorized. And if I were to use music, it would be for chamber music or for orchestra music. You know, we got to stop there for a second. And talk about that. So, what are your memorization techniques? Then uh, you were very compelling as a performer 
because of this partly, and I did mean to ask you about it earlier. Oh, um, you know, I always, uh, I am a, a believer of uh, <laughs> sheer repetition. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's number one, and then number two, understanding of um, of the gesture, of the musical gesture that is um, in front of me, and trying to follow that. It's it's extremely important to understand how the musical gestures follow one another, um, and what kind of uh, effect they are to create. And together with the repetition and the understanding of the harmony, it all together makes sense. And at the end, um, uh, enables much better internalizing of the music. Hmm, interesting. I have to say you're the first person to say that there was no music stand there. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Sorry to disappoint. No, no. <laughs> Great answer, though. Um, so what piece of music or album changed your life indefinitely? Um. Uh, Music that I learned or music that I've heard? Um, I suppose either. Again, this uh, I sort of meant like when you heard something, um, or I guess, yeah, if you encountered something, I, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I have to, to, I have to disappoint you again, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I come from, from a musical family. Both my parents are orchestra musicians. And I am sure, I can assure you that there must have been a piece that had a huge impact upon me, but I was too young to <laughs> remember it all. Ah, fair enough. Because uh, quite frankly, uh, this, may, this may seem uh, pretty uh, unbelievable, but I do remember music or a certain feeling associated with music from before I was born. Wow. Because my mom, she she played in an orchestra until the very very last days of her pregnancy, and I do have a vague, vague, vague memory of how I felt at this early formative stages uh, due to the fact that I was hearing some sounds. So, um, quite frankly, then my entire um, childhood was filled with music. The, the first thing I when I was able to sit down, I was sitting at the piano. So, <laughs> you know, but, um, I think, uh, the early exposure to Baroque music, especially on the piano, when I started learning, um, uh, piano and using both hands, this made a huge impact and really engaged my mind in, in the way that it likes to be engaged. And I think this this is what uh, helped me develop this long-standing uh, admiration and commitment to Baroque music. Wow, that's so interesting. All yeah. right, another great response. <laughs> now, oh, my now I'm wondering about the rest of the questions here. <laughs> oh. Oh, sorry, are they are they like they supposed to be yes or no questions? No, because no, no. I'm just I'm so just joking. I would say okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay. Um, if you could play any instrument other than clarinet and piano, we'll say. Which would it be and why? I would love to sing. This is something that, that really that, would, that really steals my heart when I hear um, a singer delivering a performance with this natural ease, you know, of, of shaping the phrasing, mm -hmm. going up and down in this milky, silky uh, legatos and... Uh, and also uh, incredibly enhanced expressivity uh, through being able to deliver words, you know, yeah. and to color the words with properly set, you know, uh, voice is, is really working miracles on people and on me as well. You know, so I would love to be able to sing. I think you're the first person to respond singer or vocals, which is very interesting. All right. Yeah, yeah. Use people there say few, cello there, for some reason. There are a few uh, firsts on this conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, if you could go back in time and meet any musical person, who would it be and why? Any musical person? Composer, performer, anybody? Ooh. Or even someone living, I guess. Quite frankly, I am very happy with um, having 
my favorite uh, players um, recordings you know and having the scores of my favorite composers left around um, it really does tell me a lot about the personalities and from my experience with with working with very famous musicians um, sometimes it's not such a great thing to meet someone that you idolized for a long time <laughs> because yeah. they really get disappointed and <laughs> and a lot of uh, and then it brings a lot a, a whole new set of questions to mind <laughs> and <laughs> and you know I'm quite happy with with not knowing <laughs> people that that I have admired in the music world and uh, I would like to keep it this way you know and just enjoy enjoy the work through sounds and through the left scores behind that's such an interesting point because they, they do say you know never meet never meet your idols and uh you know in some way the interpretation of the music that you have formed is your own um and meeting them might change that you know it might change a lot of things yeah so, yeah uh, from my own experience it's good to just if there are collaborations um, that bring me and some of the greats uh, together as it has happened already that's great but i would not extend myself go or any trouble to to meet anyone uh, from the past. No, I don't think so. I think they had the same or more amount of problems to solve as, as we contemporary living musicians do have. And uh, it's just, uh, it's better just to enjoy their work. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, it's interesting. All um, right. So while we're back in time there, what advice would you give, well, maybe not so far, <laughs> what advice would oh. you give your 21-year-old self? That nothing is 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 set in stone. That everything has to be flexible, and everything has to have its own flow. So, having that advice would translate to being able to let go of many prejudices or many bad habits at the same time and being even more open to experimentation hmm. uh, very early on in the game. So having less less things that that I would be overly attached to would be definitely most helpful, especially when I were young. I was very um, strong-headed and very attached to certain traditions and, and to certain myths myths about the music and performance. And I think it sucks back just a little bit. But mm. nevertheless, uh, combating those, um, those customs later um, consciously um, brought a lot of benefits. But if I were to give myself an advice, it would be, for now, let go. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy and and believe in, uh, you know, work hard, but make sure that you experiment hard as well, you know, and find like things that. That, you, that you like early on. So that would be very helpful. You got to get that on a t-shirt. Work hard and sure. experiment hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's quite a proverb right there. Yeah. Um, so other than your own book, which, of course, we're going to recommend that everybody read, um, and it will be available through a link on the show notes page, what is one book that you think every clarinetist should read? Every clarinetist should read. Um, I believe that every musician, not every clarinetist, they should be particularly concerned about the general state of their knowledge, like a general uh, knowledge, you know? Outside of music, you mean? Outside of music. Because, you know, what we do as musicians is a reflection of who we are as people. Mm. And, and I believe that that comes through a lot of... Um, processing of experiences and information and knowledge acquired um, outside of music. So I would 
I would rather advocate being a well-read individual, um, let's say in classical literature, and and developing any other interests and hobbies uh, from outside the music that would uh, sh- interest hobbies, right? That would shape our views on the world hmm. in general. So our world doesn't become music. You know, music should be part of our world. And in fact, it is just a part of the world as a whole that we know. And uh, if it becomes our world in which we live, um, it brings great benefits. But I think the limitations that it brings might actually one day outbalance the benefits. Therefore, I think our views should be much broader than music. So I would advocate really, really uh, a broad education in a number of life-related issues such as history, culture, um, and why not even economics? You know? um, and having some background in what's healthy and unhealthy, you know, in, on everyday living, would be would be very important to later on apply maybe to our practicing routine. Very interesting. So finding a balance almost between music and life. Oh, no. Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the last question. This one will have an objective answer. <laughs> How many uh, clarinets right. do you own? How many clarinets do I own at the moment? Um, four. <laughs> four. I used to own um, way more than that, um, but out of these four, uh, two is my A and B flat set on which I perform normally. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is uh, about uh, a clarinet made in mid seven, uh, uh, early seventeen hundreds, and it's an original. It's not a copy. Mm. And one is a really junky B-flat clarinet that uh, I use for outdoors <laughs> performances <laughs> and uh, all kinds of weather conditions. And sometimes um, uh, I use it as a prop, uh, like in a, in this uh, Maxime Coulet concerto that was composed uh, for me, dedicated to me, um, where I actually am a clarinetist and an actor at the same time on stage. And that concerto is based on the story of the old man and the sea. And I am, like the clarinetist, soloist, is the boy from the novel that goes into the sea in the boat, fishing by himself. And I, like when I perform this piece, I am in the boat, actually, made from a carton board on stage. And I'm dressed as a fisherman. And I use that that old clunky clarinet as a fishing rod. (laughs) (laughs) But I go through clarinets quite, quite frequently. I do not play longer on a set than three, four years. um, Because I believe the clarinets do deteriorate after, after a heavy use and abuse (laughs) after that time. And usually it comes to the point where within that time, um, I find another set that is uh, equally as good or better, hopefully, than the one that I have. And um, I make um, a, a very fluid segueing uh, to the new set, um, trying to keep my game up and, and take care of the sound as much as I can and keep improving it. So I think accessories, they do deteriorate and instruments do deteriorate. So part of the advice that I would give to myself when I was 21 to let go of things would be also to let go of instruments, you know, and to yeah. work on the, on the playing technique rather than focus um, too much, like overly focus on the accessories that that are at hand and not to become too dependent on anything, quite frankly. Uh, from touring extensively, I've learned that the instrument is called an instrument for a reason, that it's replaceable, <laughs> that it can be stolen, it can be lost, it can be uh, 
broken, it can crack, it can, anything can happen with it um, at the least expected moment. And uh, one should be able to still deliver the performance on whatever is available. Um, uh, I had I had a, a few scary moments when I actually had to play on a borrowed instrument um, because something happened to to my instruments. You know, well, this is something um, pianists deal with every day. Every day, absolutely. So yeah. their relationship with their instrument is, I think, in that regard, is, even though it's frustrating, it's healthier in a way than ours because very often uh, we grow that uh, conviction in, in in ourselves that. Our performance and our sound and we as musicians depend on this great instrument that we have. <laughs> In fact, I think it causes anxiety for people. Like, I mean, if, if you have to take your clarinet to the shop and use a different one for a day, you you feel like you're without something, you know, maybe vastly yeah. more important than, than it actually is, you know? Absolutely, yes. And to a certain extent, that should hold true because if we do have an instrument that we really like and we improve it with better pads, better uh, regulation of the mechanics and uh, mechanism and, and so on and so on and we have um, if we make our own reads and have a custom made this and custom made that that definitely adds to the sound uh, and we want to have that comfort I can see where it comes from but we should never be dependent so much on it that that playing a show on a different instrument would throw us out, you know, and we wouldn't be able to play it, and we would have to be apologetic to the audience for not delivering our best because we play on something something different, you know. Um, I, I know that this is a very tricky <laughs> subject, and uh, most of us <laughs> we love love our instrument, but if you have to go on stage and perform, the audience really does not care what instruments you you, you play on or what rig you had on the day. <laughs> Uh, people really need to um, feel something. They have to be moved. And I think this could be done on almost any equipment, but I'm not advocating on playing on anything. I'm advocating on playing on on quality equipment that enhances uh, what we can do on, on the instrument and enhances our performance. But what I'm saying is to have a healthy attitude that if anything happens... Um, the expressiveness is in us, and it is uh, very much independent from the equipment that we use. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation, and I do want to thank you for coming on today. And I, I do hope we can t- keep in touch because uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going on a bit of a tour now. But I hear you're moving to Victoria, so we might actually be able to encounter one another again. Well, yes, I will be moving to Victoria as of January 20, 2018. And to begin teaching clarinet at the University of Victoria. And um, this will be uh, definitely a new development in my career. And I do hope that while crossing Canada, you know, from coast to coast, I will have uh, the pleasure of your company again. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, Cornell. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, I would like to say all the best to all of our listeners and have good reads. <laughs> Show notes for today's episode and all other episodes can be found at www.clarinet.com. If you find that you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting it. You can do this at www.clarinet.com slash support. If you'd like to treat it like an extra read once a month or once a week, it would make a huge difference for allowing the podcast to reach not only the widest audience possible, but take care of some of the site maintenance costs, some of the costs of production, and also ensure that I can spend more time producing the show. Be sure to tune in next time for a conversation with Elena Xanthadakis, who is the director of Chroma Editions. She discusses some of the new scores that she's put together, her new website, and a special coupon code for Clarinet listeners. The Clarinet Podcast is hosted by Mo Bleichner Music Distribution. You can check out their newest product, the $49 Match Pitch Barrel, at clarinet.com slash store. Of course, the podcast is also hosted by our season sponsor, the Daria Woodwinds. Thank you so much for listening. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. 
To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Daddario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds.